All right, yes. So today we're going to talk about uh, ray modding and especially focusing on a refractive part of ray modding. Uh, refractive ray modding, uh, the, the refractive part, what it means is like how light bends to uh, translucent materials, such as water. Like water is like transparent, uh, but yet you do see something. Now, and in this example, I also shared online, you can see like what happens when water, uh, it's all gets default in a way. And we're going to look into that. Uh, mostly focusing on that, like we have more uh, objects here, like like this faucet and this bucket. Uh, but I'm not sure we have time for that. And maybe I'll go briefly through it, like what steps I took to to uh, design such an uh, object. But yeah, the main focus is on on this water type material. So let's dive in. Uh, I shared uh, this file as well on GitHub. I think it's in the comments of the YouTube. Um, you might be, yeah, it, it's, it's easier to use it as well. Uh, it might not work uh, in uh, on the Mac, at least um, the, the, the faucet, the, the demo file. That is not really a problem in the sense of the workshop because the workshop is like different uh, steps we're going to do and then those uh, should work on the Mac as well. So. What we're going to do today is like I divided it up in, in three chapters. First, uh, which takes about half an hour, I think we're going to talk about the theory of ray modding, uh, very briefly about uh, the difference between the CPU and the GPU. So, very briefly, what is a shader? Uh, from there on, we're going to talk about more about the, the, the important part about ray modding. What is ray modding? And uh, what what do we need to implement to be able to ray mod the scene? And then we'll see that we need distance functions, so-called distance functions, uh, to describe the scene. So we're going to look into that as well. And from there on, we know that the, the basic theory of ray modding, and then uh, we start to do a live coding session. So purely uh, programming in GLSL and going step by step from scratch to be able to render water. And the first, uh, after the first break, I think maybe uh, before the first break already, we can start. Uh, we start with a basic setup, setting up GLSL top, a uh, camera, maybe an arc ball camera, so we can move around in the scene. Then uh, start ray modding the scene, the actual uh, finding the distance from the camera to a certain object. We'll see that in a bit. Then we need some normals, uh, what it is, what a normal is. I will describe a little bit and how to calculate them. Uh, with those normals, we can do lighting. Maybe we do it in the in the second um, part, but it yeah, depends a little bit how fast chapter two goes. Um, and from the lighting, we do the actual refraction. So uh, what happens when we are not rendering just normal uh, solid material, but like more like water, like what happens when a ray hits water. Uh, eventually, I also added some appendix. Uh, I don't think we have much time to go in depth uh, into it, but I will go briefly uh, over it to, to describe what to do next uh, after this workshop. If you want to learn more or play around with it, and there are some helpful tools in it. Also, I included the, the floating faucet, which is uh, this guy. So the source code is available. Again, might not work for Mac because I'm using a PBR material here. And I realized yesterday that only works on, on the Windows right now. So I need to update it a little bit. If you want, I can send you the, the file working for Mac as well later on. Um, OK, let's dive in. Chapter 1. So um, the idea is like our, our studio name, YFX, that is based on a mathematical principle um, and that, that is quite powerful. It comes back like in, in math, science, programming, kind of almost everything. And it comes down to, to, to this equation. 
uh, where x x is some kind of input, some kind of value that you put into a function f. Uh, f is kind of an, a procedure or an uh, operation you do on x. So you have something, you do something with it, and the result is y. So it's really, it's quite trivial in the sense of you have something, you do something with it, and something come out of it. Now, and this principle is also happening with a shader, for example. Uh, with a shader, the input to the shader is a pixel coordinate, the position on your screen, for example. Uh, F would be the, the, the function, in this case, the shader itself, the, the uh, script or the, the shader we're going to write ourselves, programmer. And the output of this shader gives a color. So it, it kind of comes down to this, uh, that if this would be your screen, this dot, then every cell uh, is a pixel. And for every, every pixel, we have a coordinate. In this case, it's like the, the really the, the number of the pixel, uh, the, the cell, just upside down. Like the, the rows start from uh, the bottom and not from the top. But uh, yeah, the idea is like this, this shader function is being run for every uh, pixel. It's the same function. It's the same code that's being run. The only difference is that the coordinate is different. So what it comes down to is that we have to write something, write a, a program, a, a little script uh, that uses this pixel coordinate and then data mine based on this, this pixel coordinate, what kind of color to output. So what, what should be the results of the shader when the pixel coordinate, for example, is a zero, zero, uh, what color should be here? Now, and that, that's, that's what the shader is all about. Um, it, it might be more useful not to use like literally the cell numbers in the sense of here, we have uh, uh, 16 columns and 32 rows, but it might be easier to uh, normalize it. And it means like we're gonna divide it by the width and height so that the coordinates be uh, become between zero and one like this here. Um, so that it doesn't matter what kind of resolution you have. If you have like, uh, if you make the resolution bigger, you still have a coordinate system from zero and one and not like the pixel coordinates. It, uh, it's, it's more convenient to work like this and we'll see later on why. Um, yeah, what I did here to, to, to describe a little bit what, what the shader does on CPU based level, uh, we can, can show you the code a little bit. Oh. Um, yeah, so what I did here is I just looped through every cell over the X and over the Y. So first over the X and then every row, and then just write something in the cell. Now, as you can see, like it has to loop through all cells uh, every time something changes. So if a color would change, it needs to loop through all the cells. And that's where the GPU comes in, where, where shader is very powerful because this loop uh, we don't have to do. In the GPU, everything goes in parallel. So it, uh, it, it being run at the same time, kind of. And that's, that, that makes it very powerful because yeah, if you, if you had some kind of 3D or some kind of animation in your shader, then yeah, for every frame looping through all the cells, it's, it's almost not doable. So then we have a shader. Um, the problem is a little bit like if you're used to programming, normally if you would like draw a circle or something, you would say like, okay, I want to have a circle of this and this size, this radius at uh, this and this position. But now with a shader, it's not that you are like being on top of the, of the program. It's, it's like you're inside the pixel. So instead of saying, okay, I want to draw a circle here, you have to make a program kind of like um, here I did it, here I draw a circle. So we, you are processing, for example, this pixel here, and we want to know if we need to write an X or a space or nothing. And that depends on like, if is, is this pixel inside the circle?